Hi everyone. Uh, I thought that I would record again tonight to do chapter nine of Heir to the Empire. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to let you know that I may have to take a short break uh, after reading this chapter. Um, I'm coming up on my monthly limit for what I can record in StreamYard, um, so I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to squeak out another chapter or two before the month's end, but we'll have to see how long this takes. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening to this. I really had no idea that anybody would even be interested listening to me just read this book. I kind of thought that uh, I might do one video and I didn't really think anybody would notice. Obviously, my channel's pretty small, and so I, I, I don't really expect a whole lot of viewers watching it, but I really do enjoy hearing from you guys. That's actually one of the best parts of my day is hearing your thoughts and what you think about all this, so I appreciate it. Anyway, let's get into chapter nine, see where this goes. <clears throat> The tactical officer stepped up to the Chimera's bridge command station, bringing his heels smartly together. All units signal ready, Admiral, he reported. Excellent, Thrawn said, his voice glacially calm. Prepare for light speed. Hellion threw a glance at the Grand Admiral, then returned his attention to the bank of tactical and status readouts facing him. To the readouts and to the blackness outside that seemed to have swallowed up the rest of Pelion's five-ship task force. Three thousandths of, of a light year away, the Bethash system's sun was a mere pinprick, indistinguishable from the other stars blazing all around them. Conventional military wisdom frowned on this business of picking a spot just outside the target system as a jumping-off point. It was considered dangerously easy for one or more ships to get lost on the way to such a rendezvous and it was difficult to make an accurate hyperspace jump over so short a distance. He and Thrawn, in fact, had had a long and barely civilized argument over the idea the first time the Grand Admiral had included it in one of his attack plans. Now, after nearly a year of practice, the procedure had become almost routine. Perhaps, Pelion thought, the Chimera's crew wasn't as inexperienced as their ignorance of proper military protocol sometimes made them seem. Captain, is my flagship ready? Ellie had brought his mind back to the business at hand. All ship defenses showed ready. The TIE fighters in their bays were manned and poised. The Chimera is fully at your command, Admiral, he said, the formal question and response in ghostly remembrance of the days when proper military protocol was the order of the day throughout the galaxy. Excellent, Thrawn said. He swiveled in his chair to face the figure seated near the rear of the bridge. Master Sabaoth, he nodded. Are my other two task forces ready? They are, Sabaoth said gravely. They await merely my command. Hellion winced and threw another glance at Thrawn, but the Grand Admiral had apparently decided to let the comment pass. Then command them, he told Sabaoth reaching up to stroke the Asalamir draped across the framework fastened to his chair. Captain, begin the count. Yes, sir. Hellion reached to his board, touched the timer switch. Scattered around them, the other ships would be locking on to that signal, all of them counting down together. The timer went to zero, and with a flare of star lines through the forward ports, the Chimera jumped. Ahead, the star lines faded into the modeling of hyperspace. Speed point three, the helmsman and the crew pit be uh, below called out, confirming the readout on the displays. Acknowledged, Pelion said, flexing his fingers once and settling his mind into combat mode, as he watched the timer now counting up from zero. Seventy seconds. Seventy-four. Seventy-five. Seventy-six. The star lines flared again through the mottled sky and shrank back into stars, and the Chimera had arrived. All fighters, launch, Pelion called, throwing a quick look at the tactical hollow floating in his, in his display bank. They had come out of hyperspace exactly as planned, with an easy striking range of the double planet of Bethash and its complicated system of moons. Response, he called to the tactical officer. 
Defending fighters launching from the third moon, the other reported. Nothing larger visible as yet. Get a location on that fighter base, Thrawn ordered, and detail the inexorable to move in and destroy it. Yes, sir. Hellion could see the fighters now, coming at them like a swarm of angry insects. Off on the Chimera's starboard flank, the Star Destroyer Inexorable was moving towards their base, its TIE fighter wedge sweeping ahead of it to engage the defenders. Change course to the farther of the twin planets, he ordered the helmsman. TIE fighters to set up an advanced screen. The Judicator will take the other planet. He looked at Thrawn. Any special orders, Admiral? Thrawn was gazing at a mid-distance scan of the twin planets. Stay with the program for now, Captain, he said. Our preliminary data appears to have been adequate. You may choose targets at will. Remind your gunners once again that the plan is to hurt and frighten, not obliterate. Relay that. Hellion nodded towards the communication station. Have TIE Fighter so reminded as well. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Thrawn turn. Master Sabaoth, he said. What's the status of the attacks of the other two systems? They proceed. Frowning, Pelion swiveled around. It had been Sabaoth's voice, but so throaty and strained as to be nearly unrecognizable. As was, indeed, his appearance. For a long moment, Pelion stared at him, a cold feeling in the pit of his stomach. Sabaoth sat with unnatural stiffness. His eyes closed, but visibly and rapidly moving behind the lids. His hands gripped the arms of his chair, and his lips were pressed so tightly together that the veins and cords in his neck stood out. Are you all right, Master Sabaoth? he asked. Save your concern, Captain, Thrawn told him coldly. He's doing what he enjoys most, controlling people. Sabaoth made a sound somewhere between a snort and a derisive chuckle. I told you once, Grand Admiral Thrawn, that this is not true power. So you've said, Thrawn said, his tone neutral. Can you tell what sort of resistance they're facing? Sabaoth's frowning face frowned harder. Not precisely, but neither force is in danger. That much I can feel in their minds. Good. Then have the nemesis break off from the rest of its group and report back to the rendezvous to await us. Hellion frowned at the Grand Admiral. Sir? Thrawn turned to him, a warning gleam in his glowing eyes. Attend to your duties, Captain, he said. And with a sudden flash of insight, Pelion realized that this multi-edged attack on New Republic territory was more than simply part of the setup for the Sluis Van raid. It was, in addition, a test. A test of Sabaoth's abilities, yes, but also a test of his willingness to accept orders. Yes, Admiral, Pelion murmured, and turned back to his displays. The Chimera was in range now and tiny sparks started to appear on the tactical hollow as the ship's huge turbolaser batteries began firing. Communications stations flared and went black. Planetside industrial targets flared, went dark, then flared again as secondary fires were ignited. A pair of old Carrick-class light cruisers swept in from starboard, the Chimera's TIE fighter screen breaking formation to engage them. Off in the distance, the Stormhawk's batteries were blazing against an orbiting defense platform and even as Pelion watched, the station flared into vapor. The battle seemed to be going well. Remarkably well, in fact. An unpleasant feeling began to stir in the pit of Pelion's stomach as he checked his board's real-time status readout. Thus far, the Imperial forces had lost only three TIE fighters and sustained superficial damage to the Star Destroyers, compared to eight of the enemy's line ships and eighteen of its fighters gone. Granted, the Imperials vastly outgunned the defenders, but still... Slowly, reluctantly, Pelion reached to his board. A few weeks back, he'd made up a statistical composite of the Chimera's battle profiles for the past year. He called it up, superimposed it over the current analysis. There was no mistake. In every single category and subcategory of speed, coordination, efficiency, and accuracy, the Chimera and its crew were running no less than 40% more effective than usual. He turned to look at Sabaoth's strained face, 
an icy shiver running up his back. He'd never really bought into Thrawn's theory as to how and why the fleet had lost the Battle of Endor. Certainly, he'd never wanted to believe it. But now, suddenly, the issue was no longer open to argument. And with the bulk of his attention and power on the task of mentally communicating with two other task forces, nearly four light years away, Sabaoth still had enough left to do all of this. Helian had wondered, with a certain private contempt, just what had given the old man the right to add the word master to his title. Now he knew. Getting another set of transmissions, the communications officer reported. A new group of mid-range planetary cruisers launching. Have the Stormhawk move to intercept, Thrawn ordered. Yes, sir. We've now also pinpointed the location of their distress transmissions, Admiral. Shaking away his musings, Pelion glanced across the hollow. The newly flashing circle was on the farthest of the system's moons. Order Squadron 4 to move in and destroy it, he ordered. Belay that, Thrawn said. We'll be long gone before any reinforcements can arrive. We might as well let the Rebellion waste its resources rushing useless forces to the rescue. In fact, the Grand Admiral consulted his watch, I believe it's time for us to take our leave. Order fighters back to their ships. All ships to light speed as soon as their fighters are aboard. Elian tapped keys at his station, giving the Camaro's status a quick pre-light speed check. Another bit of conventional military wisdom was that Star Destroyers should play the role of mobile siege stations in this kind of full-planet engagement, that to employ them in hit-and-fade operations was both wasteful and potentially dangerous. But then, proponents of such theories had obviously never watched someone like Grand Admiral Thrawn in action. Ordered the other two forces to break off their attacks as well, Thrawn told Sabaoth. I presume you were in close enough contact to do that? You question me too much, Grand Admiral Thrawn, Sabaoth said, his voice even huskier than it had been earlier. Far too much. I question all that is not yet familiar to me, Thrawn countered, swiveling back around again. Call them back to the rendezvous point. As you command, the other hissed. Pelion glanced back at Sabaoth. Testing the other's abilities under combat conditions was all good and proper but there was such a thing as pushing too far. He must learn who's in command here, Thrawn said quietly, as if reading Pelion's thoughts. Yes, sir. Pelion nodded, forcing his voice to remain steady. Thrawn had proved time and again that he knew what he was doing. Still, Pelion couldn't help but wonder uneasily if the Grand Admiral recognized the extent of the power he'd awakened from its sleep on Wayland. Thrawn nodded. Good. Have there been any further leads on those mole miners I asked for? Ah, uh, no, sir. A year ago, too, he would have found a strange unreality in conversing about less than urgent matters while in the middle of a combat situation. At least, not in anything like the numbers you want. I think the Athega system is still our best bet. Or it will be if we can find a way around the problems of the sunlight intensity there. The problems will be minimal, Thrawn said, with easy confidence. If the jump is done with sufficient accuracy, the Judicator will be in direct sunlight for only a few minutes each way. Its hull can certainly handle that much. We'll simply need to take a few days first to shield the viewports and remove external sensors and communications equipment. Pelion nodded, swallowing his next question. There would, of course, be none of the difficulties that would normally arise from blinding and deafening a Star Destroyer in that way not as long as Sabioth was with them. Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn turned around. Yes, Master Sabioth. Where are my Jedi, Grand Admiral Thrawn? You promised me that your tame Nogri would bring me my Jedi. Out of the corner of his eye, Pelion saw Rook stir. Patience, Master Sabioth, Thrawn told him. Their preparations took time but they're now complete. They await merely the proper time to act. That time had best be soon, Sabaoth warned him. I grow tired of waiting. Thrawn threw a glance at Pelion, a quietly smoldering look in his glowing red eyes. As do we all, he said quietly. 
Far ahead of the freighter wild card, one of the Imperial Star Destroyers centered in the cockpit's forward viewport gave a flicker of pseudo-motion and disappeared. They're leaving, Mera announced. What, already? Card said from behind her, his voice frowning. Already, she confirmed, keying the helm display for tactical. One of the Star Destroyers just went to light speed. The others are breaking off and starting pre-flight speed, uh, pre speed maneuvering. Interesting, Card murmured, coming up to look out of the viewport over his shoulder. A hit-and-fade attack, and with Star Destroyers yet. Not something you see every day. I heard about something like that happening over at the Dracu system a couple of months back, the co-pilot, a bulky man named Lacton, offered. Some kind of hit-and-fade, except there was only one Star Destroyer on that one. At a guess, I'd say we're seeing Grand Admiral Thrawn's influence on Imperial strategy, Card said, his tone thoughtful with just a hint of concern mixed in. Strange, though. He seems to be taking an inordinate amount of risk for the potential benefits involved. I wonder what exactly he's up to. Whatever it is, it'll be something complicated, Mara told him, hearing the bitterness in her voice. Thrawn was never one to do things simply. Even back in the old days, when the Empire was capable of style or subtlety, he stood out above the rest. You can't afford to be simple when your territory is shrinking the way the Empire's has been. Card paused, and Mara could feel him gazing down at her. You seem to know something about the Grand Admiral. I know something about a lot of things, she countered evenly. That's why you're grooming me to be your lieutenant, remember? Touché, he said easily. There goes another one. Mara looked out the viewport in time to see a third Star Destroyer go to light speed. One more to go. Shouldn't we get moving, she asked Card. That last one will be gone in a minute. Oh, we're scratching the delivery, he told her. I just thought it might be instructive to watch the battle, as long as we happen to be here at the right time. Mara frowned up at him. What do you mean we're scratching the delivery? They're expecting us. Yes, they are, he nodded. Unfortunately, as of right now, the whole system is also expecting a small hornet's nest of New Republic ships. Hardly the sort of atmosphere one would like to fly into with a shipload of contraband materials. What makes you think they'll come, Mera demanded. They're not going to be in time to do anything. No, but that's not really the point of such a show, Card said. The point is to score domestic political gains by bustling around, presenting a comforting display of force, and otherwise convincing the locals that something like this can never happen again. And promising to help clean up the wreckage, Lacton put in. That goes without saying, Card agreed dryly. Regardless, it's not a situation that we really want to fly into. We'll send a transmission from our next stop telling them that we'll try to make delivery again in a week. I still don't like it, Mara insisted. We promised them we'd do it. We promised! There was a short pause. It's standard procedure, Card told her, a touch of curiosity almost hidden beneath the usual urbane smoothness of his voice. I'm sure they'd prefer late delivery to losing the entire shipment. With an effort, Mira forced the black haze of memory away. Promises. I suppose so, she conceded, blinking her attention back to the control board. While they'd been talking, the last Star Destroyer had apparently gone to light speed, leaving nothing behind but enraged and impotent defenders and mass destruction. A mess for the New Republic's politicians and military people to clean up. For a moment she gazed out at the distant planets, wondering if Luke Skywalker might be among those the New Republic would send to help clean up that mess. Whenever you're ready, Mara. With an effort, she shook away the thought. Yes, sir, she said, reaching for the board. Not yet, she told herself silently. Not yet, but soon. Very, very soon. The remote swooped, hesitated, swooped again, hesitated again, swooped once more and fired. Leia, swinging her new lightsaber in an overlarge arc, was just a shade too slow. Ah! she grunted taking a step backward. You're not giving the Force enough control, Luke told her. You have to... Wait a minute. 
Reaching out with the force, he put the remote on pause. He remembered vividly that first practice session on the Falcon, when he'd had to concentrate on Ben Kenobi's instructions, while at the same time keeping a wary eye on the remote. Doing both together hadn't been easy. But perhaps that had been the whole idea. Perhaps a lesson learned under stress was learned better. He wished he knew. I'm giving it all the control I can, Leah said, rubbing her arm where the remote stinger blast had caught her. I just don't have the proper techniques down yet. She impaled him with a look. Or else I just wasn't cut out for this sort of fighting. You can learn it, Luke said firmly. I learned it, and I never had any of that self-defense training you got when you were growing up on Alderaan. Maybe that's the problem, Leia said. Maybe all those old fighting reflexes are getting in the way. I suppose that's possible, Luke admitted, wishing he knew that too. In that case, the sooner you start on learning them, the better. Now, ready. The door buzzed. It's Han, Leia said, stepping away from the remote and closing down her lightsaber. Come in, she called. Hi, Han said as he walked into the room, glancing in turn at Leia and Luke. He wasn't smiling. How's the lesson going? Not bad, Luke said. Don't ask, Leia countered, frowning at her husband. What's wrong? The Imperials, Han said sourly. They just pulled a three-pronged hit and fade on three systems in the Sluis sector. Some place called Bapfash and two unpronounceable ones. Luke whistled softly. Three at once? Getting pretty cocky, aren't they? That seems par for them these days. Leia shook her head, the skin around her eyes tight with concentration. They're up to something, Han. I can feel it. Something big. Something dangerous. She waved her hands helplessly. But I can't for the life of me figuring out what it could be. Yeah, akbar has been saying the same thing. Problem is, he's got nothing to back it up. Except for the style and tactics, this is pretty much the same rearguard harassment the Empire's been pulling for probably the last year and a half. I know, Leia gritted. But don't sell Akbar short. He's got good military instincts, no matter what certain other people say. Han cocked an eyebrow. Hey, sweetheart, I'm on your side, remember? She smiled wildly. Sorry. How bad was the damage? Han shrugged. Not nearly as bad as it could have been, especially considering that they hit each place with four Star Destroyers, but all three systems are pretty shook up. I can imagine, Leia sighed. Let me guess. Mon Mothma wants me to go out there and assure them that the New Republic really is able and willing to protect them. How'd you guess? Chewie's getting the Falcon prepped now. You're not going alone, are you? Luke asked. After Bimisari... Ah, don't worry, Han said, throwing him a tight smile. We're not going to be sitting ducks this time. There's a 20-ship convoy going out to assess the damage, plus Wedge and Rogue Squadron. It'll be safe enough. That's what we said about Bimisari, too, Luke pointed out. I'd better come along. Han looked at Leia. Well, actually, you can't. Luke frowned at him. Why not? Because, Leia answered quietly, the Bipfashi don't like Jedi. Han's lip twisted. The story is that some of their Jedi went bad during the Clone Wars and really mangled things before they were stopped. Or so Mon Mothma says. She's right, Leia nodded. We were still getting echoes of the whole fiasco in the Imperial Senate when I was serving there. It wasn't just Bipfash, either. Some of those dark Jedi escaped and made trouble all throughout the Sluis sector. One of them even got as far as Dagobah before he was caught. Luke felt a jolt run through him. Dagobah? When was that? he asked as casually as possible. Thirty, thirty-five years ago, Leia said, her forehead creased slightly as she studied his face. Why? Luke shook his head. Yoda had never mentioned a dark Jedi ever being on Dagobah. No reason, he murmured. Come on, we can discuss history later, Han put in. The sooner we get going, the sooner we can get this over with. Right, Leia agreed, latching her lightsaber to her belt and heading for the door. I'll get my travel bag and give Winter some instructions. Meet you at the ship. 
Luke watched her leave, turned back to find Han eyeing him. I don't like it, he told the other. Don't worry, she'll be safe, Han assured him. Look, I know how protective you're feeling toward her these days, but she can't always have her big brother standing over her. Actually, we've never figured out which one of us is older, Luke murmured. Whatever, Han waved the detail away. The best thing you can do for her right now is what you're already doing. You make her a Jedi, and she'll be able to handle anything the Imperials can throw at her. Luke's stomach tightened. I suppose so. As long as Chewie and me are with her, that is, Han amended, heading for the door. See you when we get back. Be careful, Luke called after him. Han turned, one of those hurt, innocent expressions on his face. Hey, he said. It's me. He left, and Luke was alone. For a few moments he wandered around the room, fighting against the heavy weight of responsibility that seemed sometimes on the verge of smothering him. Risking his own life was one thing, but to have Leia's future in his hands was something else entirely. I'm not a teacher, he called aloud into the empty room. The only response was a flicker of movement from the still-paused remote. On sudden impulse, Luke kicked the device to life again, snatching his lightsaber from his belt as it moved to the attack. A dozen stinger blasts shot out in quick succession as the remote swooped like a crazed insect. Effortlessly, Luke blocked each in turn, swinging the lightsaber in a flashing arc that seemed to engulf him, a strange exultation flowing through his mind and body. This was something he could fight. Not distant and shadowy like his private fears, but something solid and tangible. The remote fired again and again, each shot ricocheting harmlessly from the lightsaber blade. With a sudden beep, the remote stopped. Luke stared at it in confusion, wondering what had happened, and abruptly realized that he was breathing heavily. Breathing heavily and sweating. The remote had a twenty-minute time limit built in, and he'd just come to the end of it. He closed down the lightsaber and returned it to his belt, feeling a little eerie about what had just happened. It wasn't the first time he'd lost track of time like that, but always before it had been during quiet meditation. The only times it had happened in anything like a combat situation were back on Dagobah, under Yoda's supervision. On Dagobah. Wiping the sweat out of his eyes with his sleeve, he walked over to the comm desk in the corner and punched up the spaceport. This is Skywalker, he identified himself. I'd like my X-Wing prepped for launch in one hour. Yes, sir, the young maintenance officer said briskly. We'll need you to send over your astromech unit first. Right, Luke nodded. He'd refused to let them wipe the X-Wing's computer every few months as per standard procedure. The inevitable result was that the computer had effectively molded itself around R2's unique personality, so much so that the relationship was almost up to true droid counterpart level. It made for excellent operational speed and efficiency. Unfortunately, it also meant that none of the maintenance computers could talk to the X-Wing anymore. I'll have him there in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Luke keyed off and straightened up, wondering vaguely why he was doing this. Surely Yoda's presence would no longer be there on Dagobah for him to talk to or ask questions of. But then, perhaps it would. That's the end of the chapter. Um, as I've mentioned before, there are some inconsistencies uh, between the timeline that eventually came about due to the prequel movies and this first EU novel. The big one here is the, obviously the timeline for the Clone Wars. Um, as I mentioned, they did try and deal with some of those timeline issues in a later book, uh, uh, actually a duology of books that were also by Timothy Zahn. Doesn't quite clear up the Clone Wars confusion stuff, but it does try to address some of the other issues that were introduced. Anyway, um, that was kind of a longish chapter. Like I said, I don't know if I'll be able to record any more chapters until the month rolls over, but I'll do my best if I can. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.